Welcome to Saving Europe. I'm the novelist and historian Henry Viner Brooks, and in this series, we're following the lives and travels of two of history's unsung heroes. The decisive leadership shown by the 6th century monk Columbanus and the 20th century statesman Robert Schumann helped rescue Western civilization in two very different dark ages. So joined by my two sons, I'm on a 4,000 mile, 12 country post-Brexit odyssey to find out if these men and these dark ages can teach us anything for today. A quick reminder, if you haven't already subscribed, then please do so now and remember to click the little bell so you can get notifications of the 50 new video shorts that we'll be releasing this year. In this episode, we explore the site of Columbana's first monastery, and we ask three tantalizing questions. Firstly, had literacy completely collapsed in Europe at this time? Secondly, what was it like to be a pioneer during this turbulent time? And thirdly, what did the physical structures actually look like? And to help us with the first two questions, there's probably no one better than Professor Jean-Michel Picard of University College Dublin. So as we followed Columbanus' route 500 miles east across the lands of the Franks, I had plenty of time to reflect on what Professor Picard had told me about the sort of situation Columbanus had just stepped into. When Columbanus arrives on the continent, he's, he's in the middle of a civil war. So basically the, Mer the Merovingian kings are at each other's throats and vast you know, battles between various you know, members of the family. And, and it's like in every century, every time you have a complete revolution and, and civil war, towns are burned, including you know, the libraries in some cases. And that situation will last until uh, 613, you know, where finally most people are dead and one of the Merovingian king, you know, emerged as the, as the single king of the, of the, as the king of the France. Yeah. When Columbanus comes on the, on the continent, I mean, basically he's offering his life, you know, to, to God. I mean, he doesn't, in fact, he probably didn't expect, you know, to be so, so successful. And in terms you know, of his uh, of his aims, I mean, at the beginning, he, he doesn't ask you know for much. I mean, all, all he wants is land, you know, space that will allow him and his group, you know, of followers to to practice the life they have chosen. He, he, he must have been, I mean, physically, he must have had an incredible presence and able, you know, to inspire, you know, awe and, and respect from other people. I mean, the fact that he. He only talks, you know, to king or, or to very, you know, powerful warlords directly. So I mean, he's, he's probably impressive, you know, physically. He's also impressive, you know, through his his speech. I mean, his Latin, you know, is is excellent. The, the letters of Columbanus are amazing, you know, document of you know hyper correct Latin. Okay, so far so good. Columbanus arrives as a sophisticated leader among a feuding warrior aristocracy that makes Game of Thrones seem frankly anemic. But what of the surviving intellectual culture? Certainly, to read some sources, one would suppose that Latin culture had, as one Oxford historian put it, come within a hair's breadth of extinction, and some contemporary sources support that view. One lamented that, quote, the libraries like tombs were closed forever, and a direct contemporary of Columbanus, a bishop called Gregory in nearby Tours, prefaced his history of the Franks by claiming that, in these times when the practice of letters declines, no, rather perishes in the cities of Gaul, there has been found no scholar trained in ordered composition to present in prose or verse the picture of the things which have befallen. Now, of course, in times of crisis, sources themselves may be subject to exaggeration. So I asked Professor Picard whether the situation was in fact so dire in the 590s, and if not, why not? Well, I would say no, no less than before 550. So yes. basically, I mean, the sixth century, which is already on the continent, a, a monastic, you know, century. And people, you know, keep copying manuscripts. The other thing is that in, uh, in parallel you know, to that Christian monastic culture, the, the old Gallo-Roman society still keep you know, functioning. So not on a very large scale, 
but you still you know have intellectuals you still have you know children of a well to do family uh, you know studying and and learning you know proper uh, proper latin the perception that the 6th century you know was a waste ground in fact comes from what happens you know, afterwards is that uh, I mean especially during the, the Carolingian you know era where again you know the Carolingians you know, would insist on, on on creating you know their own uh, their, their own history some documents are you know scraped so, and when they are written again you know on the scraped vellum we call them you know, palimpsest and so what would have been written you know in the sixth century part of it we don't have because either you know they were destroyed in the subsequent century or else the, the vellum you know, was used for copying texts in the seventh and, uh, and, and eighth century. So, armed with a less pessimistic view of literacy in Gaul, we continued our journey to the borders of the Vosges Mountains, the site of Columbanus's first continental monastery. On the way down, we awoke one morning to find ourselves at the headwaters of the mighty Meuse River. Modest beginnings are often deceptive. It is true of the Muse, for sure, and equally true of Columbanus's first monastery, which would in essence function as the headwater of over 200 other Irish monasteries. This is the, the site of John the Baptist Church. Jonas says this was the first church he built here, and we're just on a, a, a rise uh, away from what I suspect is the Cashel wall here. I mean, this equally is raised up, actually, so it could have been a Roman castrum, you know, a strategic place. I mean, this is very steep-sided. It drops down maybe 40 feet here. I think the general consensus among scholars is that it, it, this is the site. And I'd always assumed it was that other place because when you look at it from the air, it's such a discernible round area. What we're looking at here is the Church of John the Baptist. Let me show you. We're at one end. Here is a kind of apse. Um, at that end, it's still uncovered. Uh, very interesting. There's a stone sarcophagi um, uh, right down here in the in the nave. Let's go and uh, go down and have a look. I'll read to you what uh, Jonas what Jonas says. And this is King Guntram, and Guntram's not alive for long. Uh, we're in the noble twilight of his reign, and he cuts a, a decent figure as the King of Burgundy, and he's very keen for um, Columbanus to stay in his territory. The king added, if you wish to take the cross of Christ upon you and follow him, seek a quiet hermitage. Only be careful for the increase of your own reward and for our spiritual good to remain in our kingdom and not to go to neighboring peoples. As the choice was left to Columbanus in this manner, he followed the king's advice and chose for himself a hermitage. At that time, there was a great wilderness called the Vosagius, in which there was a castle which had long been in ruins and which had been called for ages Angretes. When the holy man came to that place, he settled there. Now, of course, that makes it all sound like a walk in the park, but we know it wasn't. But what I wanted to know was what it looked like on the ground to pioneer and to build new institutions on a continent that had just been traumatized by two centuries of violence and 50 years of pandemic that had halved the population. And in order to do that, we visited three places where living archeology span helped us appreciate what this beautiful corner of the Vosges could not. And the first was the medieval attraction of Goudelon Castle in central France. So Goudelon Castle, when we saw this uh, BBC documentary series called The Secrets of the Castle set here. Um, so, you know, it was nice just for the guys to be here and to see it once again. Um, that, that's the tile makers just there. You know, nothing changed. I had a client a couple of years ago in Yorkshire on the Humber Bridge just under the Humber Bridge and he owned two of the tile makers and, and the art has not changed all those years. It's extraordinary. This is us trying to uh, understand what's involved. It's just good to remember, I've built a couple of places, a couple of barn conversions with, obviously with help. You know, we talk about building, you know, putting together 
let's say a monastery, outbuildings, and it sounds so easy and you sort of think, oh, it's like doing it on plan. Now I've designed on plan, I'm a landscape architect, I've overseen the construction of parks and all kinds of things like that before I turn to writing, but you actually come to build something in this fallen world <laughs> with contractors, with your own hands. It's just the length of time it takes to do it. It's the amount of sweat and graft. I just want to uh, take my hat off to Columbanus, the people who build. It's so easy to tear stuff down, but to build and to have a vision yeah, to have a vision of a, of, a, of a future and to run toward that, like in a blaze. You know, something comes up time and time again, it's the confidence these people had, not just to protect themselves and look after number one, but to go all out and build and run leper colonies and to take in the people that no one else wanted and to give away their possessions and not hoard to themselves. It was a deliberate counterculture rebellion that they were involved in. They were rebelling against the sinful nature. And to see what this countercultural community might have looked like, we visited a site in southern Germany where they are attempting to rebuild an Irish monastery the old-fashioned way. It's lovely to be here. This is the uh, Campus Galley where they have rebuilt a Schrotten Kloster, an Irish monastery, on the old plan. Columbanus didn't always build in wood. When he went to Bobbio, there was already a stone basilica there from the time of the Romans. All he had to do was to re-roof it. And look, the shingles pegged into here. Lovely mortise and tenon joints, all nicely pegged. Trusty German oak. This gives us a fair idea. This reminds me of standing in some of those thousand-year-old churches of Scandinavia, which you can see in Norway in the great museum uh, south of Oslo. Everywhere the smell of wood. It is a beautiful smell. There is nothing to tell us that in the seventh century that the Irish were building with ornament. Everything was, uh, as far as we know, austere, basic. The life of the pioneers was hard. They suffered great privations, not just at Angre, when they were starving and had to be rescued by Carantog, but also when they were at um, Bregent, Brigantium. They were starving one winter. They ended up with a, the Bishop of Constance actually gave them food aid that time and they were rescued. And they were only there, Columbanus was only there for one winter. It just shows you the privations and the hardships of the pioneer life. It is very easy to gloss over that. They did not just survive, but they built as well. One of the difficulties with um, archaeology, of course, when it comes to wood, is that so little is preserved. One of the few references to the way that the Irish built their monasteries is, funnily enough, from Bernard of Clairvaux. And one of the things he notices is the smooth boards they build in the way of the Irish, he says. And that's what we'll see at this very old church of St. Andrews near Chelmsford. Yeah, so it's been quite instructive being here at Campus Galley. One of the things that immediately hits you is just a lot of woodwork, you know, so of all that we've seen, we've seen potters, we've seen metal workers, but there's just loads of woodworkers because of course you're building and you've got wood for your uprights, purlins, the wood for the shingles for the roofs. It doesn't it doesn't come across in the sources. That's probably because of their dualistic disdain of all things to do with the body. And yet, uh, this must have taken up a huge part of their day. They weren't just singing psalms. They were building. That, that kind of really helped me today to see just the sheer amount of manpower that is needed. And that's going to be done by the monks. They haven't got anyone else. They're doing it themselves. And they're not just doing it themselves. They're doing it themselves well, sometimes they are starving. You know, it says in Angre that they had to eat the, um, the bark off the trees. So yes, a deeper level of respect, I think. Um, you know, we just raise our hands. It's an extraordinary achievement. And there is only one other place in the world to get closer than this, to the physical structures that Columbanus and his friends would have known. And that is at St. Andrew's Church at Ongar in the UK. 
Now there's not many places you can go and see how the Irish built, but there is one place and it's the oldest church made of wood in the world, Greenstead, Essex. I can assure you, you've never seen anything like this. Now these massive oak timbers resting on oak, then on brick, these date to the 11th century. These were in place 30 years before William the Conqueror came. Um, on the inside, we'll see that they are smoothed. This is a crusader grave here from the 13th century. This is just an amazing church. So basically, we're looking at, a, you know, this is the time of the conquest, but, but, the actual church, when they excavated in the chancel, they discovered two earlier churches from the 6th and the 7th century. That is a guy called, I think he's called Ched, C-E-D-D, -D, or Ked, who came to evangelize the Saxons. So we are standing in the most historic place. Amazing spot. Let's get round the outside and we may be able to see um, the leper hole. Now the idea of a squint, a leper squint, is they were not allowed into the church, but if they could see um, uh, the communion happening and the host being raised during communion, they were said to get a blessing. And with those images in our mind, we return now to Angre in the Vos, to the site of Columbanus first monastery. A fascinating dedication to John the Baptist. Maybe he did feel like a voice crying in the wilderness, like John the Baptist. Um, up behind us is the church of St. Martin, his second, second dedication. And that maybe is purposive too, that once again, a holier man like Martin was walking among them a man, a miracle working aesthetic. Uh, certainly people flocked here and his reputation grew widely, but it was not plain sailing. One of the things that Columbana says later on when he's e ejected is he's buried, I think, seven of his brothers here. You see these graves. This is a really small sarcophagi. I'll give you an idea, I'll sit in there, if that's not too... <laughs> now people were smaller because of diets and all sorts of things, but that is a small sarcophagi. And he says, I buried my brothers here. These are later tunes, but it gives you an idea of the cost that he has to learn to let go. And he had to learn to let go of some of those dear friends of his that had really hazarded everything to be loyal to his vision and purpose to come to the continent, to be a great visionary and a pioneer, like Columbanus, like Livingstone, for example. You must never forget the cost. But while we were there, I also wanted to take a look around at the other possible site, just opposite across the valley, which is now in private hands. In the interest of being uh, thorough, and because we're here in this uh, glorious place, I just want to get down to the base of this mound just in case I can see something, you know. What I hadn't understood was to a real little hill just stuck out in the middle of this valley. You know, that's a really obvious place. This is low-lying land here. It's not marshy, but I imagine it could have been a thousand years ago because, well, it's wet here, but... Um, I'll show you one here. A little blue dot shows where we are. I mean, you can really see that. It shows where we are now at the base of the wall. And there's a house right on the top of the hill. Um, but not really appreciated how much of a hill it was. That is where they need to excavate. So let's just see what we can see at the base of this mound. You'd expect to see something. But a cash shell could be made of earth, not, not necessarily of stone. And you can see there's a a marked um, slope and then it comes up to an, a, a kind of an even area as if they've cut land away from there to build it here to fill on the bank. 
and then of course you could do a hedge um, I don't know what I'm expecting to find really but look at that you can see that is a very very discernible steep area that is not natural I think this is a place that became an Irish cashel or oh, wouldn't it be great to find some relic or some carved stone <laughs> that would be really superb somehow I don't think it's my day our final location that evening was the cave where Columbanus went to pray. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Chapelle de Columban. Looks like there's a road up there. Shall we see if we can take it? It's a couple of miles, really, from Angres just over there. Jonas says he found a place seven miles away. Rocks hard to, to climb on, or he made it sound very... Um, precipitous. This is more like uh, part of the Yorkshire Wolds. Rather nice. So it's one of their particular desires for solitude. And I can imagine Columbanus coming up through these woods, maybe on a track, maybe just on his own. It says that he happened on a bear at one place commanded the bear to leave. You haven't got to go far to find that uh, all of these people had their hermitages. Martin had his, Anthony, all those guys had them in the desert. The Irish started what they called the green martyrdom, which was to give up, in a sense, civil society and go and do what they would call spiritual battle in the wilderness. Green in their case, because Ireland's pretty green. So this was Columbanus's. This, uh, 17th century oratory was, was built on the site. Yeah, that's better. I can't help thinking this has been dug out fairly recently and it's just a couple of boulders. That have been. You look at this, this is still all loose at the back. Well, if that had been in operation, you know, for 1500 years, I think it, it would look different. This looks like it's been recently worked. Anyway, it's a cave. Who's to say it's not the cave? And it was certainly a beautiful spot to camp out and observe the thunderstorms rolling in from the Jura Mountains across the Vosges. Next time on Saving Europe, we will see Columbanus' growing team establish two other monasteries nearby under the patronage of Guntram again, and one of which would become the premier monastery in all of Burgundy. But it was not all plain sailing, and after the untimely death of Guntram, Columbana stirs up a hornet's nest with the new regime. And pretty soon, the new king, the queen grandmother, the nobles, and even the local bishops are plotting the extradition of these troublesome Irish immigrants. All this and more next time on Saving Europe. Remember also that this journey was part of the research for a book which uses the lives of Columbanus and Schumann as an analytical lens to view the course of Western civilization. Do follow the links below to find out more. Please let us know what you thought of this episode, what you like, what you didn't, what was new to you, what you'd like us to explore further. Just start a conversation below in the comment section. And of course, if you found the content helpful, then we're pretty sure you're gonna like this next one suggested here. But also while you're there, don't forget to help us by subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.